Animal research plays a vital role in furthering our understanding of how our bodies work and what causes diseases. Here, at one of the University of Cambridge's animal facilities, there are around 5,000 mice. These mice are helping our researchers in the fight against cancer, a disease that will affect half of us at some point in our lives. I'm Gerald Evan, I'm a professor of biochemistry and I'm interested in the molecular basis of cancer and I've spent all my professional life trying to understand what makes cancers tick. In particular, um, my laboratory is interested in two rather unpleasant uh, cancers, all cancers are unpleasant, but these are particularly nasty ones, cancers of the pancreas and cancer of the lung. So cancers are diseases where tissues go wrong, not just cells. So in order to understand how tissues go wrong, we have to have all the cells that are in that deranged tissue and understand how they're all talking to one another and interacting with each other. And the only way that we know of doing that is actually in living tissues as they are. We can't recapitulate that in bottles. Mice are the closest that we can get experimentally um, to human beings. Obviously, we could get much closer, but then there will be even more problems uh, associated with working with organisms that, if you like, are um, more intelligent, closer to human beings. Um, and also, mice are relatively easy to breed and maintain and keep going. So they're the best experimental system that we have, even though we would, of course, prefer not to use them. The welfare of these animals is essential. Good animal welfare and good science go hand in hand. That's why these animals are housed in state-of-the-art facilities. Before entering the facility, staff and visitors must scrub their hands and arms in alcohol rub, change into sterilised clothing and pass through an air shower. Our animals are bred in captivity and have been bred in captivity for a long time. They are very susceptible to normal pathogens that other rodents will carry. Therefore we have to keep them in very sterile environments. We have to make sure that people from the outside can't bring those pathogens in uh, and infect the animals that we have. The mice are housed within individually ventilated cages to prevent them spreading or contracting diseases to or from other mice. Each cage is checked once a day to ensure that the mice are healthy and have plenty of food and water. A technician will typically check a thousand cages each day. There's only one way to, to house animals and that's to house them well and also to house them um, in conditions that are conducive to their well-being. Animals that are well looked after means good science. Well, good animal welfare is important for very many reasons. The first is that as a scientist, uh, to be quite practical, you want to have the most reproducible experimental conditions that you can, so that whenever you do a particular type of experiment, you can rely on the data. In order to do that, you have to make sure that the animals are in the best shape that they are and also in the most consistent uh, shape. So you look after their health very, very carefully um, and you want that to be reproducible. Uh, but the other reason that you want animal welfare to be so important is nobody wants to do experiments on animals and certainly nobody wants to hurt animals if you can possibly avoid it. So the idea is to make um, their lives uh, as best as possible for them. Animal welfare is enshrined in legislation. The UK has some of the toughest legislation in the world, enforced by the Home Office, which regulates the use of animals in research under the Animal Scientific Procedures Act. We ensure good welfare with um, the training and competency of our staff. Um, one of the things that is very important for us is actually them to be able to recognise um, animals that are perhaps showing a deviation from their normal behaviour, um, whether that's due to them about to litter down or actually parts of their estrous cycle for mating or even actually a side effect of some of the experiments we're doing is having people that are able to do that is, is vitally important. But also people that have an empathy for the animals and are able to actually work in what I term is a bit like a hospital environment. Um, we have to, a high throughput and what people need to be able to do is to do that reasonably quickly and do the husbandry procedures so what people are used to at home with their, their pet animals is knowing when something's not slightly right and able to respond to that. Many of the mice within this facility will be carrying tumours 
but the mice are closely monitored by trained animal technicians to ensure that they are not suffering. They are routinely checked to see if they have developed tumours and, crucially, for telltale signs that they are in pain, however mild. Cancer is a disease where there is damage to genes that regulate things. So what we do is we genetically engineer the mice so that they're built with these genetic twists in them. And that means that they're more prone to cancers and that when they do get cancers, we can at least start from understanding a little bit of how that cancer was formed in the first place. Some of the mice will carry human tumour tissue grafts taken from cancer patients, which are allowed to grow in the mouse. So the idea is that you take a little bit of the patient's cancer and you transplant it into a mouse, a particular kind of mouse that won't reject it. And then you can do all the things that you would like to be able to do with patients in order to improve their treatment and their therapy, find out what the best combinations of drugs are, find out what makes the cancer eventually spread around the body and become the fatal disease. And you can understand and investigate all of those things, but in an experimental model without actually having to use a human being. Advances in imaging technology now allow researchers to see how tumours grow and to see, too, whether drugs slow or even reverse the growth. Um, here our technicians are using ultrasound, which is a very familiar technique for most people because it's used for uh, pregnant women, for looking for the baby in the womb. The mouse is anaesthetised just purely for restraint, so you notice there is slight movement or twitching because it's not surgery depth and they're obviously closely monitored, they're kept warm and they're given uh, oxygen with the anaesthesia, the same as human patients. And then normally within 20 minutes of being kept warm, they're up and around and it's a, a very simple and safe technique. We only use animals in research where there are no alternatives. All of our work is underpinned by the principles of the three R's, the reduction, refinement and replacement of animals in research. So the idea is to keep the number of experimental animals to an absolute minimum. And uh, that means carefully designing your experiments so that you need the smallest number of animals, which will nonetheless give you something that you can statistically say is significant. The worst thing is to use too few animals and then you end up with data where you don't know if it's true or not because you don't have enough numbers there. Um, then we refine our experiments as much as possible any time that we can avoid using animals, we can think of a different way of doing it or we can cut the number of animals, we will do that. We'll refine um, our experiments accordingly. Um, and then ultimately, we're interested in replacing. That is, not using animals at all if we can. And as technologies improve and get better, it is possible to use some technologies which cut down animal numbers and nonetheless give us useful information. While mice will play a vital role in medical research for the foreseeable future, our researchers are actively looking for alternatives to replace their use. In 2013, Dr. Merichel Uke was awarded the Three R's Prize by the National Centre for the Replacement, Refinement and Reduction of Animals in Research for work to take adult mouse stem cells and grow them into fully functioning three-dimensional liver tissue. What we do in the lab is, uh, it can be divided in several lines of research, but one of the lines of research is trying to replace animals by using a speci special 3D culture system that I developed that is called liver organoids, or we call it also mini livers. This actually represents uh, the liver's functional cells in vitro in the petri dish, and it allows us to uh, test drugs and it allows us to ask questions regarding liver physiology, but also about liver disease because we can take a biopsy from a patient that is suffering from a specific liver disease, culture it in vitro, and then we see that the culture reproduces the disease of the patient and therefore that allows us to test compounds and drugs that could alleviate this disease. The advantage of using an uh, organoid culture or uh, a culture system that mimics in the lab the organ that in vivo is that it allows us to hugely reduce the number of animals in research. As an example, if we want to test one drug, we need uh, 50 animals. If we want to test 1,000 drugs, we need 50,000 animals. 
However, if we use a culture system with one single biopsy from one patient, we can test all these thousand drugs and then define which are the best candidates for this specific disease and then test this one on the animals. But then instead of 50,000, we will only be using 50 or 100 animals because we will only be testing one or two drugs. So it is huge advantage. Every type of medicine that you take, from everyday painkillers, insulin treatments for diabetes and antidepressants, through to life-saving therapies for cancer and HIV, has been developed and tested using animals. While animal studies are not perfect, they are still our best way of developing drugs that can safely be tested in patients. Mice and humans are very, very similar, but there are differences as there are differences between any two human beings or between human beings and um, monkeys or cows or pigs. The, the important point is to um, not assume that everything you find in a mouse is going to apply to a human, but you can assume that the kinds of things you find going on in a mouse are going to be very closely related to the kind of things that go on in humans because the structure of tissues and the way the tissues and the body and the physiology works is really very, very similar. But in the end, you have to check things out in human beings. But you can get a long, long way by working with an experimental animal model so that you don't have to check everything out with human beings. Thank you.